Instructional Phonetics and Phonology, Session 8 The Consonants of English, the third part I am Mohsen Reza Zadeh, faculty member at the University of Isfahan. Overview Last session we talked about stop consonants and we finished our discussion on nasal plosion, lateral plosion, uh, tongue tap. After that, we talked about the fricatives and the affricates. Today, we want to continue our discussion and we will talk about nasals, uh, proximants, overlapping gestures, and some English consonants allophones. Nasals. The nasal consonants of English vary even less than the fricatives. Nasals together with r and l can be syllabic when they occur at the end of words. As we have seen, the mark, uh, this diacritic that you can see at the end of this sentence, uh, which comes under a consonant, indicates that it is syllabic. Vowels, of course, are always syllabic and therefore need no special mark. In a narrow transcription, we may transcribe the words sadden, table, uh, like the following. You can see the narrow transcriptions. And there is a small mark, this diacritic, um, under ne. This shows that it is a syllabic one. In fact, in most pronunciations like prison, uh, you can transcribe it like uh, just a table. That is, you put a diacritic under ne. Uh, because uh, words like these do not usually have a vowel between the last two consonants. In fact, when we say prison, uh, there is a vowel, but in pronunciation there is no vowel. We only have z and ne, one after the other. Uh, we can also have syllabic consonants um, in phrases such as uh, Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill, as uh, you see, when we say Jack and Jack and Jill or Jack and Kate, the one in the middle is nk. Jack and Jack and Kate. Jack and Kate. Nk, in fact, is a syllabic one. Um, a point about nk is that no English word can begin with this nasal. This occur only within or at the end of a word. In fact, um, we can say that ng is a mixture of ne plus g. Looking at it this way, uh, sing was at um, an earlier time in history, it was sing. Or for example, it might be sink in history. Little by little, it becomes one specific consonant um, in English language. Proximants. Uh, look at these consonants. O, R, I, and L. They are voiceless when they follow one of the voiceless stops like p, t, k, as in words play, twice, and clay. And you can see the diacritic that we use under le or under we in twice or under le again in clay. This diacritic shows that it is voiceless. Compare le in leaf and feel. Leaf and feel. What is the difference between the two? 
What about the posture of the tongue when you want to pronounce le in leaf and when you want to pronounce le in feel? In fact, when you say leaf, mm, we have tongue tip uh, which touches the alveolar ridge. Leaf. It is primary articulation. Leaf. But when you say feel, in fact, back of the tongue is arching upward and there is no contact with the alveolar ridge. It is called secondary articulation or velarization. And if you remember, we show velarization with this diacritic. We just write it in, we can say, in the middle of uh, a consonant like le. So the narrow transcription for feel should be like this. We call it the uh, secondary articulation. Here it is velarization. Um, in fact, uh, in both British and American English, the center of the tongue is put down and the back is arched upward as in a back vowel. If uh, there is contact on the alveolar ridge, it is primary articulation. If um, it is arching upward of the back of the tongue, it forms the secondary articulation. Uh, the point here is that you should know when we say leaf, it is the exact pronunciation of le, therefore we call it primary articulation. When we say feel, because it comes at the end of the word and we have the influence of the vowel preceding it, that therefore the place of the tongue is different and there is no contact uh, with the alveolar ridge, it is the secondary articulation of le. Uh, we have this influence which we call velarization. This is called secondary articulation because not this is not uh, the first thing that comes to mind when we say le, that is the uh, alveolar ridge, the tongue tip touches the alveolar ridge. We can have primary articulation and secondary articulation for other approximants as well. For example, for we, we can have the secondary uh, articulation when we say twice, here, we is voiceless. This can be considered as secondary articulation. Um, when we say while, here, we is the primary articulation. Uh, continuing our discussion on approximants, um, in American English, all examples of uh, le are comparatively velarized, or we can say vocalized, except those that are syllable initial and between high front vowels, as in freely or kill it. Freely or kill it. More examples of velarized le can be um, found in these examples ball ball or field field we uh, also have these velarizations uh, in sentences or phrases look at this example don't kill dogs versus don't kill it. Don't kill dogs and don't kill it. Most people don't have a valorized le in kill it, despite the fact that it is seemingly at the end of a word. This is because the it in kill it acts like a suffix. Technically, we can call it a clitic. Just like the suffix ing in killing. Note the difference between the two types of le are more noticeable in British English. American English examples of this phenomena um, can be found on the CD, uh, which is accompanied with your book. You can refer to the related part and um, play uh, the audio clips related to uh, velarization.
overlapping gestures. Rather than thinking in terms of static positions, we can consider each sound as a movement. So, all sounds we have been considering involve movements of the articulators. They are often described in terms of the articulatory positions that characterize these movements. But um, here we want to mention something else. Rather than thinking in terms of static position, um, we should really consider each sound as a movement. In fact, uh, this makes it easier to understand the overlapping of consonants and vowel gestures in words such as uh, bib or uh, dit or gig. In these cases, the gestures for the vowels and consonants, in fact, overlap. In bib, the tongue tip is behind the lower front teeth throughout the word. Try pronouncing it once for yourself. Bip. Bip. Where is the place of the tongue tip? It is behind the front teeth throughout the word. Bip. Now, compare it with uh, did. Here, in did, the tip of the tongue goes up for the first de, when you say did, and the tip of the tongue remains close to the alveolar ridge during the vowel, so that it is ready for the second sound de, because you know that you want to repronounce de, you keep the tip of the tongue close to the alveolar ridge, did, did, but in bib, the tongue remains behind the lower front teeth throughout the word. When you say bip, bip, and say did, it is close to the alveolar ridge, did, and it remains there. Now compare them with gig, gig. Here, the back of the tongue is raised for the first g, and again, because you want to repronounce g, it remains near the soft palate during the vowel. Gig, gig. Um, the gestures for the vowels and consonants, in fact, overlap. As you see, um, we have these overlapping gestures. The same kind of thing happens with respect to gestures of the lips. For example, lip rounding um, is an essential part of we. I'll talk about it in the next slide. All gestures for neighboring sounds overlap. In fact, the same thing happens for the gestures of the lip. Lip rounding is an essential part of we, as I said. Because there is a tendency for gestures to overlap with those for adjacent sounds, stops are slightly rounded when they occur in clusters in which we is the second element. Look at these examples. Twice. Dwindle. Quick. Where is the stop? For example, in twice, t is the stop. Here, this t is slightly rounded because it occurs in a cluster in which w is the second element. First is t, then is w. Or in dwindle, d is the first one and w is the second one. In this cluster, you can see that d is a bit rounded, dwindle, or in quick. Again, we have this cluster. We have, although it is written as u, but the sound is w. So we say that it is a cluster. Again, the second element is where the first element is a stop. So when you say quick, this k, which is a stop, is a slightly rounded. Um, this kind of gestural overlapping in which a second gesture starts during the first gesture, when you say twice, 
the second gesture that is we starts um, during the first gesture which is te this is called anticipatory co-articulation the gesture for approximate we in fact is anticipated during the gesture for the stop so this overlapping um, in which a second gesture starts during the first gesture is called anticipatory co-articulation uh, in many people's speech re also has some degree of lip rounding try saying words such as uh, read and heed do you get some movement of the lips in the first word but uh, not in the second when you say read read you can see uh, that we have some movement of the lips in read but when we say heed you can't feel the movement of the lip you can use a mirror to see whether you get anticipatory lip rounding for uh, stops like te and de so that they are slightly rounded in words such as tree and dream as opposed to t and deem try to pronounce them in front of a mirror see what is the difference between te in tree and te in t tree t tree t look in the mirror which one is rounded when you say tree we have this anticipatory lip rounding for te now try to say for example dream and deem dream deem the effect is just like we because we have lip rounding for re we have this anticipatory lip rounding for the stop which is de here dream and deem so as you can see all of the gestures for neighboring sounds can overlap from now on i want to um, in fact summarize all that we have said about english consonants so far and here you will see a list of a set of formal statements or rules describing the allophones or the english consonant allophones remember that these rules are simply descriptions of language behavior they are not the kind of rules that prescribe what people have to do and let's start with the first one given the discussion of consonants um we had in this chapter um we can give this first descriptive rule consonants are longer at the end of a phrase look at the examples what will you miss versus i'll miss it you can see that in the first example what will you miss the consonant is longer Number two, voiceless stops p, t, k are aspirated when they are syllable initial. Examples pip, test, kick. They are syllable initial, they are aspirated, and in the narrow transcription, we show it by a small h above the voiceless stop number three voiced obstruents b d g v z z and j are voiceless at the end of an utterance or before a voiceless sound as you know all of them are voiced but when they come at the end of an utterance or before a voiceless sound they become voiceless look at the examples try to improve 
try to improve. In fact, what you hear is something between V and F. In fact, it is near to F sound. Try to improve. V, which is an obstruent, is voiceless because it is at the end of the utterance. Try to improve. The other example is add to. Add to. Here, D is an obstruent and it comes before a voiceless sound in T in two. So you hear something like add to, something which is like T and it is voiceless. Add to. Why? Because this obstruent D comes before T, which is a voiceless sound. And then it leads to a voiceless sound for there. Number four, voiced stops and affricates b, d, g, and j are voiceless when syllable initial, except when preceded by a voiced sound. So they are all always voiceless at, at the beginning of the words except when there is a voiced sound before it a day versus this day a day in the first example a day because a is voiced and de which is a voiced stop is preceded by this voiced sound then you can hear that the in a day is completely voiced now compare it with this day this day here in fact if you use wave surfer program to listen to it this day and then you extract this part stay stay in this day you extract stay stay um, it sounds like stay stay why because here uh, it is syllable initial and therefore it becomes a voiceless sound number five voiceless stops p t k are unaspirated after c spew stew and skew p and t and k these are unaspirated and the reason is that they just come after s sound spew stew and skew number six voiceless sounds are longer than the corresponding voiced sound at the end of a syllable for example cap versus cap which one is voiceless? P, the second one in cap. Now, this voiceless sound is longer than the voiced counterpart, which is B. Listen again. Cap versus cap. Or back versus bag. Which one is longer? The voiceless one. Cap and back these two are longer number seven the approximants where re ye le are partially voiced after the stops p t and k Look at the examples. Play, tween, Q. The approximants are voiceless. Play, play. Now compare this le with leave when it comes at the beginning of a word. Leave. It is completely voiced. Now compare it with play, play. Here, le is completely voiceless because, in fact, it is partially voiceless 
because it comes right after p which is a, a voiceless stop or in tween tween again where which is an approximate is voiceless and we show it by a small circle below where in our transcription or q q yeah is voiceless because of k number eight stops are unexploded before another stop apt robbed stops are unexploded before another stop what does it mean unexploded when i say for example p or when i say b it is exploded but look at p in this word apt i won't say apt apt if i want to um, remove this part which is unexploded i should say apt but the fact is that here p which is a stop should be unexploded because it comes before another stop which is t so when two stops come after each other the first is unexploded like apt or here we have b which is a stop and d which is another stop so b should be unexploded so i won't say robbed i say robbed robbed Number eight, final p, t, k can be accompanied by glottal stop. Examples, tip, pit, and kick. They can be accompanied by glottal stop. So if I want to pronounce them with glottal stop, I should say tip, pit, kick tip pit kick so when we have these final p and t and k we can accompany them by glottal stop and you can see the narrow transcription number 10 t could be replaced by a glottal stop before n beaten beaten here t comes before n so we can replace this t with a glottal stop and we say beaten beaten 11 nasals are syllabic at the end of a word immediately after an obstruent Leaden, leaden, chasm, chasm. You can see that these nasals, which um, came at the end of the words, leaden and chasm, they are syllabic because they come immediately after an obstruent. Latin chasm what do we mean by a, a syllabic in or or we sometimes call it vocalic consonant or syllabic consonant or vocalic consonant um, a syllabic consonant is a consonant that forms a syllable on its own like me n and le in english words like for example button or bottle or uh, for example written and this is the meaning of syllabic consonant twelve the liquids l and r are syllabic at the end of a word immediately after a consonant whistle whistle paddle paddle 
Taylor. Taylor. As you can see in another transcription, we show it by a small mark below the liquids le and re. This mark shows that they are syllabic. So when the liquids come at the end of a word, immediately after a consonant, if you pay attention, we say wist, tell. So te is a consonant. Or for example, paddle. Paddle. This de is a consonant. Taylor. Taylor. Again, this le is a consonant. Taylor. Here, the liquids are syllabic. 13. Te, de, and mt, ne plus te, become voiced tabs between two vowels, the second of which is unstressed. Look at these examples. Kitty, daddy, and winner. So instead of saying kitty, we can say kitty, kitty. In fact, it is a voice tap, just a tap. You can just listen, listen again. Kitty, daddy, winner. What you hear is just a tap. What's the reason? The reason is that we have T, for example, in kitty. And it is placed between two vowels. Ki, di. One is e and the other one is e again after te. Kiri. So when we have te, de, ne plus te as in winter. N plus te. They become a voice tap. But they appear between two vowels. And the second vowel should be unstressed. For example, in uh, winter, the second e is unstressed. Many speakers of American English require a similar rule to describe a sequence of an alveolar nasal followed by a stop. So in words such as, for example, painter, again we have the same thing. It becomes painter. So the T is lost and nasal tap occur. For example, this sometimes results in problems for words like uh, winter and win winner winter and winner winner of a game because uh, both of them are pronounced uh, like each other t is dropped when we want to say winter we should we can say it with a tap winner and sometimes it is mixed up with winner of a game also for example for panting and panning again uh, they're being pronounced in the same way for panting, again, we can say panning. And sometimes it's mixed up with panning. 14. Alveolar consonants are dental before th and the. For example, eighth, eighth, tenth, wealth, or in a phrase like this, at this. At this if you pay attention we have an alveolar consonant like for example T which becomes dental because of the influence of th in eighth eighth if you look in the mirror you can see the tip of your tongue in the mirror which becomes dental because of the influence of th or for example in tenth tenth Tenth, again, this ne becomes a bit dental, tenth. Or le becomes dental, wealth, wealth. Or in phrase like at this, again, the first t in at becomes dental because of the second the. At this, at this. So 14 is this. Alveolar consonants are dental before these two sounds, the and the. Fifteen, te and de are reduced or omitted between two consonants. Fact finding, most people, grandmaster, best game. So, uh, you heard that I 
just dropped t and d in these words. Instead of saying fact finding, I said fact finding. Most people, I said most people. Grandmaster, you can say grandmaster. Best game, you can say best game. So 10, they can be dropped between two consonants. In best game, T is placed between C and Y, two consonants, therefore I can drop it. 16. A homoorganic voiceless stop P may occur after a nasal like M before voiceless fricative like F followed by an unstressed vowel E in the same word. Maybe the explanation is a bit complex, but if you look at the example, it becomes easy. Something, something. In the pronunciation of something, if you pay attention, we have a homoorganic voiceless stop, which is P. This homoorganic stop is I can say, in fact, included after a nasal, which is me in something. Me. And before voiceless fricative, which is th. So when we have a nasal and we have a voiceless fricative, which is followed by an unstressed vowel. Here, the exa in this example, we have e. So when we have a nasal, Afterwards, we have a fricative, which is voiceless. And after that voiceless fricative, we have a vowel. We can, in fact, include a homoorganic voiceless stop after that nasal. So in something, we included P, which is a homoorganic voiceless stop with me. Both of them are bilabial. We included P between me and th. In pronunciation, you may hear the P sound something, something. We call this epenthesis, the insertion of a stop into the middle of a word, epenthesis. Seventeen. A consonant is shortened before an identical consonant. Big game. Top post. Big game. Top post. In fact, we can't say that um, it is dropped. It is usually not accurate to say that one of these consonants is dropped. There are two consonantal gestures, but uh, they overlap considerably. So um, when we say big game, in fact, um, this consonant, the first one, is shortened. Or when we say top post, when we have two identical consonants, two P's, the first P is shortened top post. We won't say top post. We say top post. 18. Velar stop K and G are more front before front vowel. Cap, kept, kit, key. Velar stops K and G are more front before front vowels. A is a front vowel, not a back one. So when I say cap, this K is more front. E again is a front vowel. When I say kept, this K is more front. When I say kit, again E is front. So K becomes front. Or when I say key, again E is front. K becomes front. Now compare it with a back one, like for example, U in coop. Coop. Here, K is not front. But when I say key, this K is front. 
19. The lateral le is velarized after a vowel or before a consonant at the end of a word. Like file, file, talk, talk. As you can see, this le is velarized because it is after a vowel and it is before a consonant at the end of a word. Talk. Ke is a consonant. And a is a vowel. So the le in between is velarized. Or in file, le comes after a vowel at the end of a word. Therefore, it is velarized. Or for example, in feel, feel, e is vowel. And le comes after this vowel at the end of a word. So it can be either at the end of a word or it can be before a consonant at the end of a word. In both cases, uh, le is velarized. In uh, this and the previous chapter, we have seen how the transcription of English can be made more detailed by the use of diacritics. Small marks added to a symbol to n uh, narrow its meaning is called diacritic. The six diacritics we have introduced so far are shown in this table. You should uh, learn the use of these diacritics before you attempt any further detailed transcription exercises. Note that the um, uh, nasalization diacritic is a small wavy line above a symbol. Uh, we call it um, a tilde. Tilde. And the velarization diacritic is a tilde through the middle of a symbol. So nasalization diacritic is a tilde above a symbol and um, uh, velarization diacritic is a tilde through the middle of a symbol. Nasalization is more common among vowels. Uh, we will describe um, and discuss this issue in the next uh, session. So today we talked about nasals. We said that nasals together with re and le can be syllabic when they occur at the end of words. Later on, we uh, talked about approximants. We said that approximants are voiceless when they follow one of the voiceless stops. And we also talked about primary articulation and uh, secondary articulation. Next was overlapping gestures. Um, we introduced new topics regarding overlapping gestures. We said that uh, rather than thinking in terms of static positions, we can consider each sound as a movement. Uh, I gave you lots of examples um, in overlapping gesture section. Uh, we also uh, said um, what an anticipatory co-articulation is. We said that the overlapping in which a second gesture starts during the first gesture, uh, during the first gesture is called anticipatory co-articulation and at the end of this uh, session um, we um, talked about uh, 19 rules or it's better to say uh, descriptions of language behavior um, as I said uh, you should not consider them as prescribed rules to be obeyed by speakers they're just descriptions of language behavior. Uh, this is the end of uh, session eight. Good luck, everybody.